is the Wheel of Time Spoilers Podcast. Our plan is to do chapter 22 and chapter 23 today because in very typical later Jordan books, it is one scene that continues. There's a chapter break in the middle of it, but it's really one sentence to the next continues like there is no break. Uh, this feels like someone, he wrote a long chapter and Harriet just said, you know what, this needs a chapter break in the middle of it. Yeah, but both of them are a absolute name salad. Like this yes. is a, this is a Waldorf salad. This is like, there are so many extra things beyond lettuce and an olive oil vinegar dressing. Like this is such a name salad. Like I had to make a map. I have visual aids for you guys. Like it's so many names prepare to get your fiber in on this one <laughs> there's yeah there's so no romaine much. in it i'll give you no. that no, but well, like hmm, there's hmm. a lot of people in this chapter it was a lot of work to put together the notes for this honestly but there's not a lot that actually happens because so much of this is just filler and fluff and red herrings and sea folk plot that we know never goes anywhere right so we should actually be able to blast through these two in a, in one episode no problem <sighs> Yeah, there's these groups of people, and there's a lot of, like, interaction between, oh, this person has authority over that person, but since it never, again, goes anywhere, I don't care that this sea folk is dominant over that sea folk, or that these two groups... Like, there's a lot of discussion about how, like, this person kind of has the equivalent of power of that person, because they're in this boat, and I'm in that boat, and the boats are side by side, and but that boat's slightly in the lead, and so and it's just like, oh, I don't care. I don't care. You know why? <laughs> why? Because we're both neurospicy. We don't give a flying fuck about all these stupid social hierarchies and pecking order <laughs> bullshit. Yeah. This is a whole culture built on being so neurotypical it hurts. Like, how do autistic <laughs> sea folk deal? Like, how do they even exist? Well, I imagine there's a certain amount of, like, you fit, you know, someone tells you you fit into this slot and you very quickly are told if you're out of line. So I imagine, you know, there's a lot of punishment for non-neurotypical sea folk folks because they step out of line a little too frequently and are basically smashed back down with the hammer of punishment. ABA as a cultural norm. Mm-hmm. Cool. Another reason to not like the sea folk. Thanks, mm-hmm. RJ. <laughs> volunteer to become an Aes Sedai and go just fuck her off in the library for 200 years. I mean, it's basically how I've always figured I would have handled the Middle Ages. It's like, I'm going to a nunnery. <laughs> I'm going to go be an expert in illuminating manuscripts. Thank oh, you. Oh God, Goodbye. Not, unfortunately, I don't know if I would last in the church uh, hierarchy. I don't know if I could eat that crow. I mean, it's that or get pressed into an army where you get stabbed to death with rusty swords. I mean, that's probably most likely what would happen to me. Let's be honest. Yeah. Like I yeah. I have middle ages. I am running the fuck away to mm-hmm. the nicest, most intellectually bent nunnery I can find and being like, hail Jesus. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. I am running the fuck away from the world. So I am, imagine that that actually is quite appealing to autistic people who are also female channelers and weak enough to not be kept against their will. Fire Phoenix is pointing out the monk's life of brewing beer and sitting around reading is not that shabby. Yeah, dude. I mean, imagine it's like the 1200s and you have like dysentery, stupid wars or figuring out the art of brewing. I think you're going to figure out that Jesus is all right if that's your options. And also the art of brewing keeps you from getting dysentery because you boil shit when you brew beer. Mm-hmm. That's, yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. It's like I'm just saying, like the the religious life was a much better alternative once upon a time. I feel it was also just more mainstream, so it probably had more room for various differences of, between people in it. I think. So yeah, and I mean they were all over the place, right? Like monastic orders were all over the place because there was only really one church, right? Like we're talking Middle Ages, we're talking pre Reformation. I was gonna say, when was Martin Luther? Martin Luther is a contemporary of King Henry VIII. I am, I am. So we're talking like 1400s. Okay. Wow, that's later than I thought. Yeah. I didn't realize. Yeah. I thought Christianity split off way before the 1400s. Mm-mm. Protestants Mm-mm. are relatively new then. Yeah, um, no, although. there's a whole 
a period in Henry VIII's life, younger life, when he's writing like stern diatribes about why Martin Luther's a heretic. And then later in life, when he's like, I think I'd like to start the Church of England, please. He's like, yeah, that Martin Luther guy totally knows what he's talking about. Catholic Church is fucked. Um, it's a, it's a funny little turncoat thing because he then wants to start Church of England. So, um, yeah, they are contemporaries and the split between the, the Reformation of the, with the Lutherans and the Church of England split are relatively speaking next to each other in history. And it's like, uh, when people do scientific discoveries at the same time, you know, and we credit one, not worth the other because they were like a few minutes earlier, but, <laughs> you know, they're basically figuring out the same thing at the same time. I feel like there's a certain amount of that going on yeah, with the church. Yeah. Darwin and Wallace being the really famous example, but yeah, 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 for sure. Also, like the Wright brothers and there was someone who I don't remember because they don't get the credit, but they would have like launched a few weeks later. Um, and they end up flying on their own plans with their own, you know, they just didn't do it first by a couple of weeks. So they don't get the credit. Nobody gives a shit about the second guy. Nope. It's nope. terrible. It's terrible. We are procrastinating so hard on getting to this chapter. We are. Hoyd and Cosmere has an interesting little treatise on what people value the most. Um, and he comes down on originality. That it doesn't matter if you do something that somebody else has done. If it's not original, people will just call you derivative and ignore you. It's not the art. It's not the science. It's not what you're doing. It's not how good it is. It's are you doing it first? Are you doing the original version of it? Being first is such a silly obsession, but it also drives like entire lunar landing programs. So drug development companies. I mean, the whole patent system is based around it, right? Well, that's what it says in the shiny brochure that they want you to look at. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the, the, the idealized patent system. Yes. You know. <laughs> Very much so. Anyway, we are off in the weeds on this one. We are really not wanting to get into this guy because um, I want to eat my steak and potatoes, not my salad. And this is named salad. This is major salad. Major, major salad. But we've got a map. I've got sticky notes. We're going to power on through this. I don't know how long we've been recording already, but we're going to do this. Not long. Only 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Editing already is going to pay for that one. Ay, ay, ay. All right. All right. All right. All right. Let's get going with chapter 23, To Lose the Sun, which starts out with the, or which the icon for is the far matting icon the formatting sigil city banner the formatting flag it's the formatting flag it's the hand shield and sword now is that the shield or is that the image of the guardian which is sort of you know how the people who are in charge of the guardian wear like an oblong red oh. um thing with uh, a gold uh, around the outside and they it's did a, a terrible gold job of noting their sword. costumes yeah <laughs> um so the people who who do the guardian have this sort of Oval with two points on it, and there's probably a name for that shape. Um, pendant that's red, and that represents the like the weird domes that point to people. The guardians are hard for me to visualize. I will admit, I read through the the description of, of them a few times, but it's not obvious to me what they're supposed to look like. Same. I'm bad with costumes and bad with set pieces. <laughs> I'll read it. A blue field divided vertically in the center by an elongated red oval of even dimensions. On the side nearest the flagstaff was the golden hand, and on the other end was the flag that was a golden sword. A simple straight blade and cross quillions point upward. Yeah. So I thought that was something very exciting, and then it, it's just the formatting flag. Mm -hmm. And I don't really like formatting, so I'm annoyed. <laughs> I, you know, formatting on principle has a lot of interesting things that it could have, they could have done with it. But again, this is one, it's, Rand goes there, we get this little sort of vignette of him killing these Ashaman. We get a little bit of Codswain being ridiculous. And then they leave, and then formatting never matters again. It doesn't matter in the last battle. It's waste of paper. Waste of paper. It could be any city in any setting. Yeah. It's, ugh, whatever. Trying to hold the unfamiliar woolen cloak tightly around her with one hand, trying not to fall out of the even more unfamiliar saddle, 
Shallan awkwardly heeled her horse forward and followed Harreen and her swordmaster Moad through the hole in the air that led from a stable yard in the Sun Palace to... she was not sure where, except that it was a long open area. A clearing, was it called? She thought that was right. A clearing, larger than a rock in deck, among stunted trees spaced out on hills. The pines, the only trees among them she recognized, were too small and twisted for any use but tar and turpentine. Most of the rest showed bare gray branches that made her think of bones. The morning sun sat just above the treetops, and if anything, the cold seemed more bitter here than it had in the city she had left behind. She hoped the horse did not misstep and tumble her down onto rocks that stuck up wherever patches of snow did not cover the rotting leaves on the ground. She distrusted horses. Unlike ships, animals had minds of their own. They were treacherous things to climb on top of. And horses had teeth. Whenever her mount showed his, so near to her legs, she flinched and patted his neck and made soothing sounds. At least, she hoped the beast found them soothing. I love that the boat people in this series are categorically not horse people. Mm -hmm. Just like categorically across the board, swan and the sea folk are like, no, boats? Mm -hmm. Boats are cool. Horses? Horses are literally shadow spawn. I feel like the same way with people who like are car drivers and then get on horses and go, I can't control this the way it's not a machine the way I would control a car. It has a mind of its own. It's I have to work with the animal. I know some people that are absolutely terrified of horses. I mean... When you think about how big they are as animals, how strong they are, how much they can kick, how much they can bite. Yeah, they're terrifying. Yeah, they're terrifying. We have two horses that graze here, and they're kind of neurotic, and sometimes they'll just tear around for no reason. And if you're outside in the field and you hear the thunder of horses, it's like, um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) these two horses are just, are, are they running at me? Like, they're just, they're giant. They can hurt you so easily without meaning to. Or if they're a mandarb, they mean to. Oh, and then Fairfax is pointing out in chat that maybe horse people don't like boats either, because Nynaeve is totally a horse person, and she's not she a fan boats. of boats. <laughs> Egwene and Rand are both horse people, yeah, and they don't have There's too many horse boats, people though. in the series who yeah. are fine with boats for that to be uh, too close of a correlation. But the boat people do not like horses. No. And I think no, you're right don't. that it's it's probably more relatable to drivers than anything else. Yeah. Horse people in the modern day society are a little different, I think, than horse people in the Wheel of Time. Because back then it was like, oh, yeah, you, you have to have one to get around. You know, it's like most people aren't car people, but they own a car because they need to get to work. Whereas like Fayil is a horse person. Right. Totally. And she totally. doesn't No, She's on a boat that one time. She doesn't like fish. Fayil is, is on record as not liking fish. That's true. She doesn't have issues with boats, but she's not a fish person. So, But she is very much a horse person. <laughs> Her and Elaine. And Elaine has no issue with boats or with fish. Those are the only two horse people I can think of. They prefer centaurs to horse people, okay? <laughs> oh, yes, and Matt, of course, is a horse girl. Matt is yeah. definitely a horsey girl. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And he doesn't mind boats at all. No. So, yeah, it only yeah. goes one way, apparently. Anyway, um, I have a couple of notes about the Windfinders, or not the Windfinders, about the Seafolk. Just mm-hmm. a couple of little t- small notes about the Seafolk, because, I mean, they're, we are in Shallan's perspective for this, so, like, it's a Seafolk perspective. So it does feel like we get some background on the Seafolk in this, some culture building, that sort of thing. Yeah, we get a lot of the backstory of what's mm-hmm. going on with them, but... Shalon, as we will get reminded in this chapter, had an affair with Ailil and is being blackmailed about that. And she actually um, is also going to be present for when the news comes about the Amayar all committing suicide. She's mm. in that meeting. Gotcha. She's one of the people in that scene. And I believe Harine is there as well. And Harine, who is her younger sister, does is destined to become mistress of the ships, right? Min says she's going to. But according to my research, that clearly has to happen after the last battle. Because mm-hmm. Zyda is mistress of the ships up into the last battle. So she has to take over that role in the aftermath of Zyda dying. And we don't necessarily know. It, it appears that Zyda was in a dangerous section. We don't see her die, but it's possible that she died or was injured in the last battle because she was in a area that was heavily attacked. We just don't get her... Right. Specific details. So it's very possible that she becomes, you know, well, wave mistress. Mistress of the ships. Of the ships. 
like right after the last battle. Yeah. Kind of the same way that Cod Swain becomes Amarillo. Exactly. In the suit, right after the last battle. Very yeah. much so. And then Moad is just a bodyguard. And the last we're actually going to see of him is the cleansing. He's the one of the few people who's guarding all of the regular like civilian characters, Min and Harin, basically. He's the one who's like, no, you aren't channelers. I have the biggest knife. So I'm going to guard you and you're going to just sit here while all the magic booming happens. But that's the last we're going to see of him. So that's that's our sea folk entourage for these two chapters. And then we also have the Aes Sedai entourage, right, who, is, who are with them. And they're split into, as far as I can tell, two groups, the trusted and the untrusted. Yes. The ones... Okay, so <laughs> visual aids, visual oh, aids. Yeah, I am yeah, showing yeah, yeah, the yeah. camera. I have literally, like, there was a boat icon because the analogy is boats. So there are 12 sisters in this chapter. Let's just start there at the top. There are 12 Aes Sedai in this chapter. Now I'll read them off real quick. Gadswain. Obviously. Alana and Varen. Obviously. Mm -hmm. They've been with her forever. Yeah, forever, forever. We've also got Daigion, Kumira, Nasun, Elza, Serene, Karel, Maurice, Arian, and Beldine. Hence the name Salad. Also, we've got the warders Ivan, Thomas, Eben, Jahar, Nethan, and Basan, and Dahmer. All those people count as as warders. Some of them are also Ashaman. So basically, you've got two main groups. You've got Cad Swain and the people that she likes. Daigion, Kumira, Nasun, Karel, Maurice are with Cad Swain. Then you've got like the group that's not as trusted by Cad Swain. They're a little more resentful of what's happening, and that is kind of headed by Nasun, but it is Nasun, Serene, Arian, Beldine, and Elsa. In the Path of Daggers, chapter 29, that group of five begs to be allowed to swear fealty to Rant. The origin of their swearing was Varen compelling them when they were in the tents. Yeah. So yeah, Cadswain has her unaligned ones that are swearing to Rand or aligning with him free and clear. And then she's also got the tag along group of five who all have sworn under compulsion and right. are tagging along because Catsman wants them around, but doesn't bring them into the circle in the same way. And then of course you have Varen being who she is. That's obvious. Right. To, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just obvious that she's doing her own thing. And then there's Alana who is, Doing her own thing in a different way. She's very, like, with one group and then with the other group, and they're kind of fighting over her, but really, Cad Swain's in charge, and it's... The only reason Cad Swain is using Alana is because of her bond to Rand. She's using Alana to track him down. She's like, you know, that when, when they ask, is Rand in the city... Well, how does she know that? She knows because she's got Alana's bond to point her in the right direction. And it's very obvious in this chapter. It's like, Screaming signals. <laughs> and I think there was a little triangulation, tri you know, triangulation going on, right? So uh, that's a theme, right? That, mm -hmm, that both mm -hmm. the Guardians triangulate people can channel and Alan is triangulating Rand. And that's how they're able, you know, what's a quick way to identify where someone is? Well, if you got someone with a bond and gateways, you gateway to two places that are sufficiently divergent. And if she has a direction, you can just find the intersection of those two points and pinpoint exactly where somebody is. Is that what they were doing? Yeah. Oh. I th I th I'm pretty sure that's one of the things that, that they did with Alana. That would make sense. That would make a lot of sense. I had not picked up on it, though. Gateway, you know, if, if you know he's in this direction, you gateway a, a thousand miles north. I, I don't think we actually see her gateway anywhere else to pinpoint him exactly. But I'm guessing that's one of the ways that you can... Because like so often she's uh, they ask someone with a bond where you know where's this person and they said well I know they're in that direction I don't know exactly how far but I know they're in that direction and they're pretty far away yeah, roughly how far by how roughly how far yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah right and so you do that twice from two different directions you know even better three times and you've got yourself a pinpointed location yeah I hadn't quite noticed that but you're right I mean that they absolutely are moving around enough that. That I mean, they probably have three points, the amount that they've moved around slightly off screen. That does make a lot of sense. So, yeah, that's the basic overview of our name salad. I do have one nugget of information per person so that we can just quickly hit as each name comes up. So that way there's some chance 
that the name salad has some cohesive structure, but that's the overall nonsense that we're dealing with. And so there's a lot of speculation from the Sea Folk POV why the Aes Sedai have these certain ranks. I don't think we need to go through that. I think we already know. Yeah, it's it's very simple and basic. And so, yeah, we can go skipping along and let me see which names we're going by. Okay, Alana and Varen. I, you don't need me to tell you who Alana and Varen are. Daigion. What do I have for Daigion? Daigion um, is going to be killed by Shaidar Haran. That's what's going to happen to her. Obviously, she's bonded to Eben. We see that here. But that's how she's going to go out. She's going to go down to Shida Haran when Semarag is escaping. That whole scenario. Mm. And then we look at uh, Kimira, who is going to die to Grandal in the last battle. And then we get up to Nasoon, who... Uh, just lives in general. She kind of ends up joining the dragon sworn ranks for the last battle and is presumed to live. Elza, we all know what happens to Elza. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I hope we all remember that Elza is also going to die to Rand by Balefire. That's fun. Is that um, when she's behind Semarog? Or yeah, yeah. yeah she's she's because Shida Haran removes the compulsion. No gives her compulsion and then the compulsion includes telling Semarag remove it from my mind so then she gets kind of stupid mm, and then right. is in uh, Semarag's wake as she goes up and does the whole thing with Rand and Min mm. and so yeah she gets <laughs> hit in the back you could say she's basically already dead at that point yeah yeah she's a dead woman yeah. walking for yeah. sure at that point but she well, dies I mean, her mind's fried yeah so her and her and Daigian both die in that event but at different points in that overall event but yeah, that gets us through a couple of pages of just, like, Harin's bitching. And Shalon is distracting herself from the bitching by looking at the Aes Sedai. I love this line about Harin. Harin would never take a lover who stood lower than she. And now, of course, that meant she could take none. That just, like, dude, lower your standards, girl. <laughs> yeah, that's that's too much obsession with prestige and status. RJ makes the sea folk just uniformly obsessed with status, and mm. I hate it. It bothers. It, it just gives me the heebie-jeebies. I don't like it. Where do you think Moad learned to ride a horse? I think he's just, like, been more willing to take advantage of shore leave rather than being a sea folk superiority person and thinking, like, oh, we're so much better than them. I bet that as a trader, he was really interested in, like, interacting with people and meeting them where they were. And the best way to get someone to want to trade with you is to let them talk about their favorite hobby. So you find a trader who's also a horse girl... <laughs> and pretty soon you know how to ride horses and you have a trading partner for life. I right. think that's how he learned to ride a horse. He's also described as gray haired an older man. So who knows what sort of past he's had? Who knows where in his life he may have, you know, it, it reminds me a little bit of Andral, right? He's done a lot of stuff, has a lot of skills. Um, it's just, a, he's a blade master. So he's got to be pretty competent in that, that area. Like who knows what else he's done on shore. Yeah, he's clearly his life. clearly spent some proper time off of a boat. But yeah, they've been... So Harin is bitching about the conditions that Cad Swain set in order for them to get to come along, starting only last night. So, right, they all take off from the palace for, in Andor, and they show up here. But Cad Swain set all these conditions, and we don't know what all the conditions are. We learn what some of them are. In the course of these two chapters, but Harine is just going on the endless carousel of griping about it for a couple of pages. And she's able to set those conditions because she says she can take them to Rand. And that's what they want, right? They want a meeting with Coromor and they don't know where he is. And she goes, well, I'm going to go see him. You can come with me if you do X, Y, and Z and commit to these things. And she's like, well, I'm the bargain says I'm supposed to, you know, be able to see him whenever I want. And it's clearly breaking that. And I'm like, are you, I feel like, you know what? Well, the book bother me. They're the Karens of the wheel of time. They're like, you're not following the rules. Yeah. I'm here and I made an agreement and you need to. And, and people are like, I don't care. I do not care about your stupid agreement. Like things have changed. You I don't care if you're trying to hold me to it. Like your terms are ridiculous. You think you're these amazing bargainers, but you really just like jerk people around. And so I'm just not listening to you anymore. 
And they're so behind the times on realizing the urgency of the situation. Like, they just are not getting the memo that it's the end of days. And it's it's just, ah, it's very, can I speak to your manager even though the building is on fire? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know what? Those rules about leaving one at a time and, you know, getting your food in 20 minutes or less don't matter when the building's burning down. Like, they just don't. Like, get out. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they, they're, yeah, this thing, whole thing of trying to follow the letter of the law during the end of the world is ridiculous. just ridiculous. Yeah. Not unknown, but ridiculous every time. Um, I love that they talk about a sex tent, which is how they determine <laughs> uh, longitude and latitude, or is that just, which one does the sex tent determine, right? Because I know one of them you can determine. Everyone in the chat is saying they heard sex tent, like sex igloo. Ah. Um, no, sex tan. <laughs> sex tan, sex darling. Tant. Right, yes, no. The sex tent is something that Matt uh, enjoyed with a dark friend back when he was hanging out with the Aiel. Uh, what was it? Mel- Mel- Melindra. Cindra or Mel- Melindra? Yeah. But yeah, I love that a sextant exists in this world and that it's something that only the sea folk have and they very carefully keep even the existence of it hidden from everybody else i adore that for them as annoying as they are i really like that for them it really is the reason they are in charge of the open sea Mm -hmm. and they call people you know like doman is a shore hugger right he'll never sail to the open sea because he has no way of determining exactly where he is because he doesn't understand the technology of the sextant exactly because if you're going out into the open ocean you really need to be confident that you know how to find land again. Mm-hmm. It's very, mm-hmm. very important. And one of my favorite, favorite stories in the whole world is the entirety of Shackleton's trip to Antarctica, but particularly the part where the navigator managed to take like two fixes on the horizon in a rowboat and still managed to get them where they were going nice. because he was that good with the sextant and luck was th- Shackleton's trip fucking to Viren. Shackleton is a hero of the horn, and that was a Taviran adventure. You mm. cannot change my mind. It's an insane trip. But the the sextant, when the at the end, I just sextants are cool. I I have no idea how to use one, but they're very cool. Okay, you guys want to know the difference between latitude and longitude? I got it for you. Latitude, ladder. Longitude, slices of an orange. Latitude, rungs of a ladder. Longitude, like slices of an orange. Longe, orange, lad, lat. Latitude is the one that goes up. So it's the rungs of the ladder. Longitude oh, is north Jesus. to south. Like, so it makes slices yeah, of an orange. I'm, I'm totally backwards. I'm 100% <laughs> wrong. Yep. This is why longitude as orange slices is what has kept me safe from making that mistake ever again. <laughs> oh, but when you said orange slices, I immediately pictured latitude. Like you just took it and sliced it vertically through the. Why would I do that? Why would I do that? That's how I, that's what I would say orange slices as opposed to, um, orange wedges. Oops. Fine. That's a good point. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I should use my words more correctly. Ugh. This is why it's so hard because there's so many different ways to, you know, vertical versus horizontal. Yeah. It doesn't work. Yeah. If you can remember one really, really consistently, then the other one is easy. Don't try to remember both. Just remember the one that's easier, and then the other one Mm -hmm. is is process of elimination. But yeah, it's very, very difficult to know how far east and west you are when you're in the open ocean. But north and south is easier. A small amount of error will propagate very quickly into you and your crew dying. Getting lost at sea, a lot of people have, have proven the wrong way to navigate in the ocean let's Mm -hmm. put it that way but yeah it's 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 absolutely about just knowing how to use the thing and estimating where you are without actually having the tool and being like well i can guesstimate you know the tool will give me a more accurate reading but i know about where the sun is i know about where we are based on on that information i'm able to gather and so they've gone a long way and their mind immediately goes to putting instead of people through these things ships through the the gateways Which, I mean, no individual can create a gateway big enough for a ship. I would agree with that, yeah. Because even Rand barely creates a gateway big enough for, like, because don't they have to leave the carts? This is the whole thing where, um, remember when they do the raid against Gabriel, they're practicing with carts instead of wagons because the carts are shorter? Right, Rand can make one big enough for a wagon, but the average channeler... 
even the powerful can't. ones can't. Yeah. Right. And so if Rand can barely make one big enough for a wagon, right? Like, and he's the most powerful channeler of all time. No individual can make a gateway that big. However, a circle of 13 windfinders might just be able to make a gateway big enough for a ship to sail through. Honestly, I bet a much smaller circle could, given the way that power stacks, given like even one Angreal, like, I bet that it would be very easy for a few powerful ones to make one big enough for at least a small ship with the mass steps down, like going, you know, under a bridge or whatever. Right, right. Yeah, I'm sure they have that. Maybe, maybe not their full rakers, but. Harreen asks Shallon to go spy, go pretend to betray her to Cadswain in exchange for the weave of traveling. To which Shalon is like, gulp, because she is already supposed to be spying on Harine because she's being blackmailed about her affair with Ailil. So, rock in a hard place, Citrin. Yes, <laughs> rock in a hard place for sure. And then uh, Serene comes up as they're talking about this. Serene is notable for having an affair with her warder. She's going to have a tempestuous love affair with her warder. Mm, she's the one who wrote poetry about mm-hmm. him as being comparing him to a leopard. Yep, yeah. yep, that one, that one. At some point, he's going to find those poems, or she's going to accidentally blurt something out, and then they are going to have a passionate bodice ripper of an affair. It's going to be great. Um, but yeah, that's all that's notable about her. Good for her. Uh, but she shows up and has she has history with Harine that gets referenced here. Do you remember that? Mm-mm. Okay, so she comes up and is like, hey, so you might be uncomfortable with me being your person, your attendant person, but also Cat Swain said so, so we're going to do it. And uh, Hareen, instead of telling her to go fuck herself, Hareen has all the signs of embarrassment and humiliation and avoidance and is like, I don't have a problem with you. Everything's fine. I just don't like you. Just go away. And it's because at one point, Cat Swain got really mad at Harina a while back. And sent her away with Serene and told her to, if she doesn't cooperate, spank her, but be diplomatic about it. Oh, okay. I was looking. I was like, I knew there was some interaction, but I couldn't track it down. I looked for a while and, and never found it. Okay. That's that interaction. And so her. So somebody got spanked and they're not, and they're just saying, oh, that happened in the past. However, orders that have been carried out can be forgotten. They no longer need to be spoken of. Do you understand me? Let's pretend that you did not spank me into into submission. I had that highlighted as a big question because I was like, I don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. That's what that was. Another uncomfortable moment of spanking being used as a means of discipline on grown women. Especially by Codswain, who's going to, you know, use it on Semarag. Well, by proxy via Serene, but yes. Yes, yeah. And Shalon doesn't know about that. That's the thing. Is Shalon's like, why is mm-hmm. Hareen acting so weird? And it's because she doesn't know that that happened. But we, as the readers, do. Shalon is missing a lot of things we know in this chapter. That's kind of her role here, is to be the clueless person that you feel smart explaining things to. Right. If you were paying attention to who these people are, and you have an Aradia sitting there telling you what's going on. Because... I had no clue. I'm becoming a noun. Even with research, I had no clue. <laughs> I actually am already a noun. Becoming a lowercase noun. No. <laughs> Cutswain reveals that they're outside of farm adding, that that's where they're heading. That's where, you know, she thinks Rand is, even if she doesn't say as much. Yeah, and I have a very cool nugget about Catswain. But you didn't think I was going to have okay. a nugget about Catswain, did you? But no, I do. I didn't. From Origins. Oh, okay. Her name. Her name comes from Coxswain, as in the officer in charge of steering the boat. Huh. <laughs> huh. And it was early, right? That was one of Jordan's very early yes. notes. Like, Codswain was back. People were like, oh, he just came up with her once he got rid of Moraine because he didn't really know what to do. It's like, no, Codswain was in the original notes. She is old school Jordan. She's part of his uh, world building. Note taking. Basically. Yeah. Um, and the, the last name, as far as the or as the book says, uh, is just made up. Um, but she, because of how she tries to take control and steer Rand, she is literally mm-hmm. a cockswain, cad swain. So there you go. That's fun. By the way, I was totally right about Nakomi. I still haven't looked at that entry, so say no more. Okay. Say nothing. I will. I will read it eventually. 
Not right now. Even though the book's right there, and I totally could. With, with some caveats, right? Like, I wasn't... I, we will I, talk I, about I it later. Of, yeah. Okay, For, okay, okay, okay. Later. Later. I want to talk about it now. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is your producer speaking. It's not at all relevant. I just want to bring it up. <laughs> Seriously. Okay, so they ride along towards the city. Catswain's like, let's go. They go. Uh, Shalon thinks about how her husband might declare their marriage vows broken if her infidelity is discovered. So she, that's her whole, like, I'm trying to, trying to cover that up. They're treating Alana like she's recovering from an illness, which I think is the death of her warder. I think it's the triple bonding. Uh, she passed okay. out for like three days when the triple bonding happened. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's that that didn't treat her well. Because okay. it just happened. Like, right, right. Two days ago. Oh, so I guess she was only passed out overnight. But anyway, that's what it is. But yeah, Shalon's like, this tells me nothing. And it's like, it tells you so much. Clearly something about Alana is connected to Rand. It must be a warder thing. She thinks she knows so much about warders and Aes Sedai, and she's just so ignorant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, I'm glad you're on top of this chapter, because I totally was not. <laughs> it's your turn with the next chapter. Oh. Do, 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 do. Okay, so then also, now we've got Arian, Beldine, and Elza. So Arian... Uh, Arian, there's a fun note about Arian. She's supposed to be at the cleansing, but she's not. RJ actually, according to the website, the um, encyclopedia or whatever, RJ meant for her to be at the cleansing and just forgot to write mm. her in there. She's supposed to be there. I remember hearing that. Yeah. That like she's, she's standing there in the background. Just nobody notices her. Exactly. Nobody dresses where she is. Yeah. It's just like an oops. Those. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, and then, El and then Beldine is going to bond Carlden, the Ashaman, at some mm -hmm. point, And then they will both die when the Sharans attack the Aes Sedai. They're both going to die in the initial volley of that attack. And then Elza, obviously, is Elza. And we all know how that's going to end. Mm -hmm. And then Shalon had them in the same boat with Serene, right? So you've got the five. Nasun, Aranin... Beldine, Elza, and Serene are all in the same social boat, and that's because they're the five who needed to swear. Yeah. Yeah, there's two boats, and Cad Swain is somehow in charge of the fleet. There's two boats, two tag-alongs, and Cad Swain's in charge of the fleet. <laughs> Despite the fact that there's, like, three factions that are not truly hers. Yeah. So, yeah, you got Maurice, Corel, Kumira, and Dagion are in the, uh, the good boat. Yes. And then Alana and Varen are just whatever. Doing their own Doing their own thing. thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and yeah, then there's this whole freaking paragraph about how reading social cues is so instinctive and obvious and natural that it's a super relevant plot for everybody. And um, no, all of us neurospicy people do not give a shit about lifted chins and raised <laughs> eyebrows and how your eyes are getting pushed in out of your head. It's it's not relevant plot. Thank you. And there's a, a thing here where Shalon had expected among 12 Aes Sedai there would be more than seven warders. Well, that's because the five warders who were in the non-trust or the five Aes Sedai who were in the non-trusted category were not allowed to bring their warders. Oh, yeah. I hadn't quite thought about that line so much. I was just like, whatever. It's just your ignorance. But you're right. There's a bunch of mm -hmm. warders missing. And that's because there's, uh, yeah, uh, Cod Swain's generosity, or if you're on her good side, you got to bring your orders. If you're not, you didn't. Oh, uh, yeah, no, you're right. You're totally right. Which is good because some of those orders are dark friends. Uh, true. Yes. Yes. Very true. Cad Swain is not just being a weird, power hungry tyrant in this case. In this case, she's making a very reasonable precaution that probably helps. I have to wonder if Varen somehow hinted to her that she had something to do with them swearing. No. I mean, did the Varen caught no, because no. then that would make her dark friendly. Yeah, no, no. Varen is absolutely 100% doing her thing solo. But yeah, but Rand trusts those five almost explicitly because they get, well, there's actually six of them, but those five get the, they, you have them in the palm of your hand prophecy from Min. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's those five plus Soralia. <laughs> Who is not compelled by Varen, so clearly the viewing has nothing to do with Varen. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, she speculates about the warders, and if the Ashaman are warders, they, they are. are. Here's, you know, they are. And uh, Karel and Dahmer are hinted at sleeping together? Sure seems like they are. Sure seems like mm -hmm. Karel's whole 
weird. I'll bear your children if you tell me how Rand, you healed Rand from the dagger wound in his side. That whole weird interaction. Mm -hmm. It seems that their connection has gone all the way. They seem to be very, very fond of each other, but it's not ever confirmed in any meaningful way. So that's, I mean, not that she's pregnant, but just that they're, she could technically get pregnant. Kind of weird. Gotcha. But right. whatever. Right. She's a nice to die. She's a grown woman. She can do what she wants. And there is, there's an interesting possible error in the next chapter around Narishma, but we'll, we'll talk about Jahar Narishma, well, but that's in the next chapter. Okay. I also didn't look, or I glanced at the entries for Nethan and Basan, the two other warders, and there's like, or no, I didn't look them up because they seemed very boring. I'm assuming they don't do anything interesting. Yeah, it looks like it's just Basan and Nethan accompany, Basan and Nethan accompany, Basan and Nethan accompany. Yeah, there's yeah. no, they don't do anything interesting on their own. They are sexy lamps. Yeah, and like Shalon's thinking that if she can somehow prove that the Aes Sedai have Ashaman warders and she's going to be able to blackmail Katsuin into leaving her alone. And it's like, girl, you are so many corners behind the entire <laughs> rest of the pack. Like, oh my God. Mm -hmm. Like, she knows she doesn't care. It won't work. Like, not the, the first premise you've got is wrong. And so then we get basically as they enter formatting, we get a summary of what formatting is, right? That they have these things called guardians. They're two Terran, they're Terran Grial that recreate steading. There's a smaller ring that is basically just the island that keeps women from channeling. There is a larger area outside of that that keeps the men from channeling. So the men, as they get closer, they, they can't channel first, then the women can't channel. It also has this line that any channeling from outside the Guardian Ring cannot affect anything inside the Guardian Ring, which makes me think that it's got a very much a Matt's Terangrial effect if you try and channel into formatting. So I think some people are like, why doesn't Rand just stand outside and threaten to bail fire the entire city? And I don't honestly don't think that would work. I think the, the weave would fall apart if you tried to bail fire the city from outside. Agreed. And it's a very interesting description because it says it's perhaps one, it's one Terangrial or perhaps three. And then we only get the, dis the two part description. It's a very, I wish this description went farther. Well, there's three domes, right? There's three domes that all have arrows that point and that's how they triangulate. Right. Well, she says the city possesses a Terangrial or perhaps it is three. No one knows. They or it cannot be studied any more than they can be removed. Right. So it's a three piece. Like when you when you actually get to the description of it, when they get into formatting, right, there's three domes that all have an arrow and then they point and they use that to triangulate. So that is the Terangrial? Yes. I somehow thought that was just kind of the indicator dial on top of the actual Terangrial. I think that is the actual Terangrial. Yeah, the indicator dial is the Terangrial. That both indicates and stop. We'll, huh. we'll, we'll definitely get to that next yeah, chapter okay. and read it in detail All and right. discuss it when we get there. But yeah, it's basically just an artificial steading except for the part where Ogier can live there. Mm -hmm. and it doesn't have the piece. It all, all it does is the, the effect of not being, not letting channelers channel. It doesn't have any of the Ogier piece, Ogier otherworldness that the Ogier Steading appear to have because the Book of Translation are literally brought them in, you know, translated the Steading from one world to the other. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then we get a really fun bit of lore and and sea folk uh, history and culture. Did the woman really believe in people five spans tall who sank to trees? There was something about axes, too. Here come the Aelfin to steal all your bread. Here come the Ogier to chop off your head. So much fun. I love that. And then she mentions that she hasn't heard it since Harina was in leading strings because turns out Harina's literally young enough to basically have been raised with her youngest, ch her eldest child. That's the age gap here. She has to be subordinate to a sister who she literally raised with her own first child. But uh, the Aelfin and the Ogier in this little nursery rhyme, mm -hmm. I love it so much. Here come the Ogier to chop off your head. And why do the Aelfin want bread? There's nothing about bread. Uh, I, I assume they're just tricking you and stealing. Well, you bread your body, right? Oh. In the Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, sense of the word, right? Like, this bread is my body, right? They're going to steal your 
spread everything that you are, everything that you okay, own. Okay, yeah. They're yeah. going to trick you. Yeah. But then the oak gear, chop off your head. <laughs> right? I mean, they do put a long handle on their axe. You would not want to make an ogier angry. And also, they probably have some interaction with the uh, Sean Chan ogier. The, um, whatchamacallum? The gardeners. The, or the, the, gardeners. the gardeners, I think, are just the order that protects the imperial family. We don't know really what the, all the ogier are like. But yeah, it does indicate that the, the ogier ferocity is not something exclusive to Sean Chan. It kind of maybe is just part of the collective history of the ogier and the ones in Randland are maybe more pacifistic than the collective Ogier people were once upon a time. I'm just saying there's a lot of legends about Ogier getting pissed off and really going ape shit. And then when we see them in the last battle, they are an incredibly effective fighting mm-hmm. force. Yep. They're like a combination of orcs and trees. Yeah, they're so cool. So then we have a very funny exchange between Serene and Harine. Okay, I don't understand that at all. The whole philosophy discussion? What? It's so funny. Okay, so what happens is that Harine says, perhaps you and I can discuss instructions. Harine means instructions from Cad Swain involving getting spanked and whatever. Or instructions involving, like, the protocols of meeting these people. Serene hears instructions with a capital I. It's an actual piece of philosophical work. Because she says, you read the philosophy, the theory of instructions, capital T, capital I. Oh, okay. The theory of instructions is not thought well of these days. So she's like, oh, you read the instructions. You want to talk about this, like, obscure, esoteric text. And Harine's like, no. Is, is Serene white, Aja? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. This makes more. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> the theory of instructions is absolutely a lot t- text on philosophy and logic that the white reads. Yeah. Yeah. Sh- gotcha. Okay. So that's just a total, total misunderstanding between two cultures. It's very autistic. It's a very autistic mis- misinteraction. I love it. I giggle every time it comes up in the audiobook. <laughs> Like, the way Kate Redding delivers it, it's just the way they miss each other. They just, the point, you missed it. It's so funny. That's that's a great miscommunication. I never noticed that. Um, there is a book called Theory of Instruction. Oh. Uh, let's see. Published 91. Oh, okay. okay. So, it would have been out when this book came out. Uh, in the book Theory of Instruction, Principles and Applications, Siegfried Eagleman and co-author Douglas Carney, Kareen, Describe the theory underlying the development of direct instruction curriculums. Engelman and Kareen not only spell out the in detail the scientific and logical basis on which the theory is based, but provide a multitude of in-depth descriptions and guidelines for applying this theory to a wide range of curriculum. It's not well thought of these days, but I've always believed that there's much to learn here, says Serene. <laughs> also, I, I just want to say that the author's name, Kareen, C-A-R-N-I-N-E, is actually really close to Sareen, the author of this book, Theory of Instruction. You replace a C with an S and an I with an E. It's entirely possible that Jordan got the name of this I Sedai from the author of this book, which she mentions right here. All right, I got my origins. I'll look this up real quick. Yep. See, see if it says anything about that. Sareen, are you in here? Sareen, are you in here? Are you in here, Sareen? <laughs> That's good. Aww. No. No, he did not. Wait, how does her name spelled? Do I know how things work? No, S- yeah, no, I went right past S A R. It's not in Origins, but I think we found an entry that got missed. I think we did too. I think we need to write into Origins and be like, listen. We dis- we've discovered mm-hmm. that Serene mentions this book, and her name is clearly taken, clearly taken from the author of this book. I'm 100% on board that we discovered this. All right. Well, we can make a to-do about it. I will put notes when I'm doing this in editing. I will mark that up and make all kinds of <laughs> notes for it, because there's no fucking way. That's too much. Of a- I mean, far from the matting crowd is entered, but this mm-hmm. isn't bullshit. Bullshit. Like, a book that she specifically talks about in titles 
abs freaking that ha- would have been out for years by the time he wrote this book. Uh, what's what's her what's her first appearance? I'm literally looking at her wiki. No, first appearance is New mm-hmm. Spring. So yeah, that's not helpful. I mean, after what about in the main series? Because the New Spring hasn't hadn't come out at this point yet. New Spring, New Spring, Lord of Chaos. She teaches Egwene in a novice class. Oh, not until Lord of Chaos. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, very much that book was out by the time that mm-hmm. so he must have read that book. I'm like, this is cool. I'm going to throw a nice to die with a reference to this book in there. Just, just a fun Easter egg to myself. God, that's such a good catch right there. Yeah, I'm proud of us. That that is great. We're gonna just just coast on that one for a little <laughs> while. Hell yeah! I would. Uh, it would absolutely just strike me as uh, wonderful if this was to, to be discovered in Robert Jordan's library. Yeah, yeah. Be one of those like, how did you know? Be like, well. <laughs> That's so cool. Mm. What a, what a catch. Yeah. What a catch. Yeah. And just knowing how he comes up with his book, his, his names, I cannot believe that her name did not come from the philosopher. He's like, well, I like this philosopher's name, but I need another S name to throw into the books. So I'm going to take his name. He did not have enough S names at this point. It's true. He did not have enough S names. So he went ahead and just, just replaced the C with an S and threw it in. Yeah. 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 Returning to the book... Shalon is wondering what it would be like to lose the sun. And the answer is depressing as hell. She does not handle losing the sun well at all. But she's just riding closer and closer, getting more and more anxious about how it's going to happen. And then it happens. They ride close enough that it happens. Mm -hmm. And it really shakes her. At first, she's like, I'm okay. But actually, the longer it goes on, the more she's like terrified of losing her connection to the one power. Yeah. It's uh, a thing that channelers are pretty universal in not wanting to have happen. Mm-hmm. So the next thing I have is the bit sort of at the gate where Codswain gives the money to peace bond their, all, the, all the warrior swords. Of course, the, the sea folks see that as bribery, but she's like, no, it's, they're peace bonding these things with this. I thought it was interesting. Lead tape. Disapprove. Lead. Well, I mean, because lead bends easily. Disapprove of handling that much lead as a common part of your job. <laughs> don't don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah, but it does make sense Solid because lead it's is, so soft. Yeah, it it is. You know, and it, you can bend it like that, and then you. But it's all then hard to unbend without breaking it because once you know, it's the more you bend it on a bent piece, it's gonna it's gonna break, and then you put those seals in there that you know probably bond to the lead in a way that makes it very hard to peel them off without breaking the lead. Right. So, yep. And it's, you know, I feel like at this point we could really get into a conversation about, you know, weapon control and gun control if we wanted to, because I think there's a a real argument to be said, like, hey, So, yeah, we're coming back from the tangent that will be at the end of the episode. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, if you don't want to get into politics, uh, please skip this one. It's we go pretty far off the uh, liberal politics deep end. You know, when you hear it, it's at the very end. Don't worry about it. Anyway, back to the plot that matters. I just don't complain. It's after the music. If you don't want to hear it, stop the music. Go to the next podcast. I, I put I put the spicier stuff at the end for you. Mm-hmm. We're not going to talk about the chapter anymore after the music, we promise. Right. But are we going to talk about it now? Or? Mm, yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. Swords only become useful when wits fail. Not a bad strategy. <laughs> That's coming from Moad. He just has this like one excellent, like little bits of, mm-hmm. little bits of wisdom and then he's out. We get a clue here that the Amayar are, in fact, just like the Tuatha on because they have trained dogs. Hmm. I yeah. didn't catch that. Her warders were like the trained guard dogs the Amayar used, ready to leap at a whistle. And I'm like, we, we've speculated many times that the Amayar and the Tuatha on are different branches of the same pacifistic people cast out by the breaking. This feels to me like a strong confirmation of that. I like it. Like, because we don't, we get so little information about them and, until they kill themselves. And we're just like, what, why? But, and, and, and it also makes sense that the sea folk protect them because they are the pacifists of the sea folk. And there's a certain amount of like, we do not let them come to harm because they are the ones who don't harm anybody else. Yeah. And they keep the peace of the waterway and all this other mm-hmm. esoteric stuff right. that RJ assumed that we were putting together in our spare time that we did not. <laughs> um, so they go in the Camelin Gate, which is, you know, 
if you exit the Camelin Gate and go down that road, you end up in mm-hmm. Camelin. And there's a statue of Ennainen of Arhen, which... So, I guess the only question is, who is this person, right? Like Just some random person. This filler detail. I'm assuming some first council person. She is one of the three most famous first councils in the history of farmatting. It doesn't say why. It doesn't say what she did. She's just one of their famous... She li- built yeah. the city up. We built this city with... Guardians. We built this city. Maybe you know she founded a city of uh, a city of brick and made it a city of marble. You know. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Everything vanished except her fear that she would never feel the source again. She had never before realized what comfort she had taken in its unseen presence. It had always been there, promising joy beyond knowing. Life so rich that colors paled when the power was gone from her. And now the source itself was gone. Gone. That was all she was aware of. All she could be aware of. It was gone. Someone shook Shallan's arm. It was serene. Because that's literally how the chapter change happens. Yep, there's no... POV switch, there's no time passing. That last sentence was from chapter 24, Among the Councils. And our symbol is the Flame of Tarvalin. Someone shook Shallan's arm. It was Serene, and the Aes Sedai was talking to her. It's in there, Serene said, in the Hall of the Councils, beneath the dome. Withdrawing her hand, she took a deep breath and gathered her reins. It is ridiculous to think that the effect is any worse just because we are close, she muttered. But it does feel so. Shallan roused herself with an effort. The emptiness would not go away, but she forced herself to ignore it. Yet in truth, she felt cored like a piece of fruit. And then we see the the place, which is a pretty cool piece of architecture. It's a giant freestanding dome, which are always fun. Right. Isn't it? Is it blue on the inside? I think so. Yes. Yes, it is. Um, so I think that's sort of where the map comes from the flag is that like you've got the sort of the gold sword and the gold hand and then you've got that blue dome dome, and the inside the blue dome the big blue dome is where the blue of the flag comes from yeah it's very cool big columns big dome lots of frieze artwork it's very grand Mm mm-hmm uh, she sort of makes fun of the big statue. These people had made a monument proclaiming their success at trade. That was foolish. When people decided you were better at trade than they, they not only grew jealous, they became stubborn and tried to demand ridiculous bargains. And sometimes you had no alternative save to accept. And I feel like this is a sea folk saying it, when, who everyone has decided the sea folk are better at trade than they are. So I feel like she's talking about her own situation where she's had to accept ridiculous bargains because the sea folk have a reputation for being really good and people have demanded ridiculous things out of her. I'm nodding. And it's like moving that Overton window of like, we're I'm going to demand the ri- most ridiculous thing I can get out of the sea folk. But sometimes if the bargaining situation isn't that good, like with Cotswain, they have to give in and they end up just getting screwed. Totally. So they ride up in there. Catswain takes control of the situation as she does. Mm-hmm. It was very much like dealing with bureaucrats. Codswain has no issue being like, honey, could you please uh, get the queen and tell her, you know, and, and would you run this time? Because uh, I've got a discipliner um, like I did last time 20 years ago. Some big yikes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I, did I say queen? Sorry. First among equals. The Kara Karn mm-hmm. of uh, the mm-hmm. First mm-hmm. Council. Okay. Well, because, okay, so the first council, right, that's the group of people who run the city. They used to advise the queen of Moredo. Moredo was the country in which the city of Farmatting was in. Moredo was gone. Moredo has fallen apart. What we're left with is a city state, kind of just like, um, where is Matt right now? Ebudar. Ebudar, just like Ebudar, right? They, the queen there, she's called a queen, but she's really more of, the mayor? The mayor of the city. <laughs> you know, she runs the city. She runs a city state, right? There, they are these places called city states where they, they do have their own laws. They have their own population centers. They're big enough that they kind of work like a country, but they don't claim the countryside around them. Yeah. That, that's about, that's fair. Yeah. Um, and then this is just, you know, was the head of the council and that's become a queen-like position. Yeah. First among equals is pretty 
Ragnar. Chief among chiefs. Like, yeah. like that's... There's a certain uh, pattern that I see Jordan going mm-hmm. with here. Mm-hmm. Same thing with... Uh, what was it? The... In Tyr, you had... The High Lords. Oh, you know, you didn't have a king. You had the High Lords of, of Tyr. Yep. Yeah. And they don't have one particular first among equals per- person. They just have equals. But yeah, ruling by council. Mm-hmm. Wasn't there a highest lord, though? Or something like that? Wasn't there one who was, like, more in charge than so. the others? It's, it's the seven. It's, or no, no, it's the nine. Mm. Seven. There's a small council. I don't know. There's the nine bees of Ilion. So, I don't know if they... That's the flag. I don't know if they have... Well, the Ilion has the king and the nine. Tyr just has whatever the high council is. Right, right. I forget okay. specifically, but I don't think that there's anyone singled out for us in the plot as a particular tyrant leader until Darlin mm-hmm. goes in there to be like, hey, I'm going to be the king now also because mm-hmm. I have this cool design that Min gave me. And then you said there was something to talk about about Jahar at this point. Yes. So um, it's when he is... Uh, it's actually a oh, little bit longer. it's a little farther ahead. Okay, so at this point, he vanishes to do something, and we will be yes. talking about that in a, in a few minutes. Right. So, and, and th- when the Guardian triggers, it says a male is channeling, right? So, the assumption is it's Juhar, right? Yes. That's why he's behind. That was my right? assumption very one. much so, yes. Mm-hmm. In Encyclopedia Watt, at a winner's heart signing, Robert Jordan stated that it was Dahmer Flynn channeling outside the male shielding zone, not Narishma. But that's... Right. And so maybe she's wrong about where he went. However, where did Narishma go? And how did Shalon not notice that Flynn was missing? Right. So the, the question is, did Jordan make a mistake at the signing or not? I think so. Because he only singles okay. out one Ashaman is missing. You can't decide that it was the other Ashima. Like, I'm sorry, but red herring rules don't stretch that far. Mm -hmm. This is where, like, he forgot about one of the Aes Sedai at the cleansing. He's mixing up which ones, like... It's almost like the name salad was a bad call. Bad thing, yeah. (laughs) Almost like there's maybe maybe too many names. Well, and this is when he hired uh, Maria and... uh, Who's the other assistant? The, The male... I'm not sure. Yeah, it's always Maria. It's in the audiobook uh, or in the in the origins book where it says there's... He hired two assistants. Maria was sort of there to handle... Some of the con- Alan. Thank oh, you, Alan. Yes, oh yes, yes, yes. Alan yeah. Romanchuk. And so Alan was the one who's sort of doing a lot of this, keeping who was where continuity. He was sort of the continuity e- editor, and so he was trying to make sure all the characters were, you know, they weren't in two places at the same time. And, and they got brought on around here. Um, I think it was closer to book seven, but seven, eight, nine. Like this is sort of the era when. Things are getting really crazy around who needs to be where. So he ha- he needed assistance at this point to keep track of all the characters. Very much so. <laughs> yeah, it, it seems to me that there was this this significant change after the first six yeah. books, yeah. right? Based on everything I've heard, especially in Origins, um, it seems like after the first six books, like going into book seven, he hired on people to help him with continuity. He slowed down the pace of writing. He really sort of, and, and also I think he was diagnosed with amyloidosis around that time. Oh, yeah. He didn't let us know for a long time after that, but yeah. For a while. Yeah. yeah. Maybe a little bit after that, but sort of within that era, it seems like he really did change his pace of writing. And his contracts kept changing too. So, but yeah, it, it texturally does change very dramatically. We're definitely in the middle third, texturally speaking. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. But yeah, they, they go up and look at the, the dome. They all get to walk into the guardian room and Shalon gets to be very impressed by the architecture of a freestanding dome that is a hundred paces or a hundred feet high. I'm not actually sure when that becomes not an impressive feat in the history of our architecture, but it's impressive. I mean, a freestanding dome of any size is an impressive feat of architecture. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I feel like when, once we discovered steel, Oh, is that what it was? It wasn't like some kind of Roman cementy thing? I mean, Romans love their domes, right? Don't get me wrong. Um, their arches and stuff like that. I'm sure they, they built something. But I think when it stopped becoming an impressive feat is when we had architectural steel. And we're able to just be like, oh, yeah, we can just hold that up with something. There's We have things that are more than strong enough to support that kind of weight. Yeah, I, I don't know much about architecture. Architecture is, uh, I think it's pretty. That's about how much I know about it. <laughs> Kamira's kind of giving us a little bit of like, 
nervous talking info dumping a little bit. And she lets us know that Cad Swain has a history with the city. She was last here 20 years ago. During the Aiel War, right? So that's, I'm always wondering what was going on during the Aiel War that Cad Swain is hanging out in farm matting, disciplining the ruler of the city. What dumb thing was she doing? I would love to know more about that. I would love to know more about that. We've got nothing to speculate with. Nothing. There's no hints to speculate with here at all. Just more spanking. That's not, that's not helpful. And I do think we get something about Codswain regretting what she was doing during the Aiel War because she wasn't involved. Although I, I do think she was like, but Rand, Rand was kind of pointless to look for because he was just a babe. And she's like, I'm just going to wait for him to grow up and then I'll go look for him. Because that makes more sense. As opposed to Moraine, who was looking for him the whole time. Codswain's like, yeah, that's dumb. He, he, he'll, he'll make himself known when he's an adult and then I'll go find him. Yeah. Yeah, who knows what petty bullshit Catswain decided she needed to get involved in. Honestly, I think that she has an oversized sense of her own importance and she could easily get caught up in something that ultimately doesn't mean anything in the long run just because she Mm -hmm. gets too short-sighted about what's important. She thinks that she has the long view, but did she always? Did she always? Kind of like how... uh, Swan was trying to protect that one Mirandian lord, and that's the, her her whole history with Bryn and that whole situation. And then the Mirandian lord doesn't oh, go anywhere. Oh, right. And it like, turned out, right. He just ended up dying because. Yeah, I mean, Catherine has yeah. to have made similar bad calls in her career. So yeah, we get our explanation of the guardian with the detail of the of their costumes. So the women are wearing white. And beside them, a disc. So you think each of the discs beside each of the women is one of the Turangreal? Well, that's they don't know, right? That's the whole point, is they don't know if it's three or if it's one, because there are these three discs, but they seem like they're part of a single object. But, you know, the same thing with um, the Paralysis Net, right? Is that multiple Turangreal, or is that one Turangreal, right? These They work together, so they're clearly linked, but would they work separately? Could you just do women? Could you just do men? Could you just do the indicators? I don't know. Tell me more, Jordan! Right. Three women in white sat on stools spaced equally around the edge of the floor, right against the dome's wall. And beside each woman, a disc a full span across that looked like a crowded, clouded crystal had been set into the floor and inlaid with a long, thin wedge of clear crystal that pointed towards the chamber's center. Metal collars surrounded the murky discs, marked off like compasses, but with ever smaller markings between the larger. Uh, Shalon could not be sure, but the collar nearest her appeared to be inscribed with numerals. So that's basically a compass on it, right? Directors. Right, that's the triangulation part. It's easy to understand that part. I just, I always figured that they were like indicator dials and that the thing, in, that there was something in the middle that was the actual thing. And there's no description of that here. My brain is just Mm -mm. writing fan fiction and replacing it with the actual canon. Like, right. It's just three crystal dials set into the ground, you know? And, uh, that's so unassuming. It needs to be grander. (laughs) I'm with Shalon on this. Like, how can it be so mild looking? You know, she had imagined something huge and black that sucked in the light, right? Like this, incredible dark sphere that was destroying the ability and it's like no it's just it's like basically a ward as far as i can tell or a dream spike or something it's very mellow and then a procession of people with an aggrandized sense of self-importance come marching in and shallan's like wow they know how to mark out rank i'm so impressed and i just roll my eyes I have no notes on that. Yep. And it does feel very Minority Report-esque. I agree, Lilligen. The the scene down there feels very Minority Report. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. I feel like the three people should be, like, in a bathtub, uh, spouting gibberish. It, it always weirds me out that they sit there on these stools, which stools are uncomfortable, lack of back support. And they sit there all day watching a device that barely ever twitches. Like, barely ever twitches. Like, no one comes to the city Mm -hmm. and tries to channel. Like, this is not something that needs to be staffed to this degree. Although, in fairness, it will detect channeling outside the city, right? So, there's the three ranges. There's the inner range where women can't channel, the outer range where men can't channel, and a further out range where it will detect channeling. Oh, really? Yes. The, The area in which it detects channeling is larger 
than the area in which it blocks channeling. I did not know that. That's why it detects, I'm going to say Narishma here, channeling, because he's outside that outer barrier, but he's still channeling close enough to the city to set off the detectors. Interesting. I thought that the detection radius and the nope radius were the same thing, and I thought that was kind of redundant and weird, and this always felt very strange to me, and that makes so much more sense. And so that's why they point outside, right? They can either point inwards to something, somebody channeling in the city, which never happens because... Nobody's ever had a well before. Or what they normally do is they point outwards and they use the triangulation outwards to detect that someone's channeling near the city, but not actually in it. I just so much more respect for formatting and their design around this thing now that I understand how things work. (laughs) Oh, man. Okay. Thanks for explaining that. Yeah. And so that's this whole thing here where she goes, oh, you detected somebody channeling. And they're like, yeah, it's not a big deal. It's outside the city. We don't care. Yeah. I never understood why they were so chill. I just... I just kept reading. It was like, whatever, I'm ready to be done with this plot anyway. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Because I think the Guardian is the most interesting thing about formatting by far. Yeah. So, yeah, we have a meeting of the parties. We get the whole thing where Harine has to say that uh, Cad Swain stays with her no matter what the feud is with Cad Swain and Elise. She's like... That's part of the bargain that Cad Swain made with them to bring them along. We don't know all the pieces of that, but this is one of those pieces we do discover. Yeah. And Cad Swain drops a few sick burns. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you have no longer have any bad habits for me to correct. So much story not being told there. So much story. (laughs) Basically, the next thing I have is Varen pointing out that a man channeled. Also, I find it interesting that the ruling council, besides Elias, they were 12. That's a total of 13 women. Again. Thank you, Jordan. Everyone wants to put their councils (laughs) into 13s, obviously. 13s. Yeah. I can't imagine why. Yes. Mm. So original. Mm Mm-hmm. And I, I, I had canon that that's always because I and I form circles of 13 so that they can bond and there's no point in going bigger than that because they can't bond. And then all these ruling p- classes copy the, the group of 13 as an important number to have. Yeah. And also there's a 13 forsaken and like mm-hmm. 13 sacred numbers don't lose their power just because an apocalypse swept out all of the actual knowledge. Right, right. Well, yeah, there's there's definitely, I feel like there's twofold of like, there's 13 being something that, that makes sense because that's how the biggest circle you can get and people copy that. But it's also Robert Jordan loving the, the number 13 and sticking it everywhere he possibly can. Yeah, because he's a big old nerd that liked paganism. That's my headcanon. A man just channeled, Varen said suddenly. She had not joined the rest and was peering over the rail 10 paces away. The dome made her voice carry. Do you have many men channeling lately, First Council? And so this is, she saw it before any of the people who were supposed to be watching for it, because she knew it was going to happen. <laughs> she was just waiting to say that. She was so mm-hmm. ready. Mm-hmm. That was a practiced speech, because she knew Narishma was out there to channel, to set up, set it off. And he probably, the, the timing, I'm sure, was deliberate, right? Yeah, no. Everyone is very anxious for this whole thing to go as quickly as possible. This is orchestrated. This is fast. This is not dicking around. Mm-hmm. Um, so, wh- yeah, I, I, again, with the Guardian. Yeah. It warns and locates and defends. How does it defend? Are there laser beams? Will it go pew, 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 pew? Oh, I assume that's the whole, you can't channel into the city if you're outside of it. It will defend by blocking the weave the way Matt's Angriol blocks yeah. the weave. But I think Kimira's like, what else could it do? And I think it goes pew, 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 pew. You think it does? Yes. I think it has pew, pews that they forgot how to operate. Mm, I don't think it does. I'm, and I'm just going to hang out with Kimira and we're going to, we're going to design how that must be working. <laughs> and, and Ver- Varen's doing the weirdest thing here. Putting herself into this position of seeming very, very inconvenienced. But also mm-hmm. she like absolutely asked for that attention to be brought down on her, even when Cad Swain tried to deflect it. Varen's like, no, 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 no. I want this. I want this scene so bad. She points this thing out, gives a fake name, won't stop rambling. Do you know what do you know where her fake name comes from? Oh fuck, I did know. I knew a few months ago, I forget now though. Uh, what's the fake name? Edwina. Do you know what her husband's name was before oh, she yes, left him? Yes, that's what it was. Edwin. She Edwin. would have married Edwin. And so then when she comes back 400 years later or whatever, she calls herself Edwina. And it's very Titanic and makes me sad. Which is very much like, I think that's what her name, I think she's getting away with telling the truth there because her name actually would have been Edwina, which means probably wife of Edwin in farm adding. 
I really doubt that formatting women change their n- names. Handmaid's Tate. Yeah, that's style. a good point. Hmm. No, she says, you may call me Edwina. She's, she's absolutely within the Aes Sedai names thing, but she picks the name mm-hmm. to honor the man she would have stayed and married in formatting. And it's so sweet. <laughs> Yeah, Cat Swain does not like this is this is so funny too because Varen goes off script for the first time and Cat Swain's like, I thought I knew you, girl. What are you doing? Like Cat Swain has been very confident in Varen because she's been so playing her her role, right? And this is the moment when she gets to just lean in super hard and go off script and insert a whole bunch of her stuff. And Cat Swain is like, what is happening right now? Because she sees what Varen's doing, but she has no idea why. And that bothers her because Cat Swain is used to knowing what's happening. Do you know why Varen is doing this weird interjecting herself thing? Not really. Not really. I don't quite get what she's going for here. I mean, she's threatening them. Yes, on Rand's behalf, but yes. She's basically saying, yeah, she's saying, oh, yeah, you know, just in in the the absent-minded brown, gosh, you guys got your ass kicked by Guar Amasalan. Guar Amalasan. Man, and he was just a good general with some armies. He didn't have any channeling. It didn't really help you against... The the Guardian doesn't really protect you against armies. You know who else has a bunch of armies? Um, This Dragon Reborn guy. He's got all these armies. I'm sure he would attack you. Also, have you heard of the Sean Chan? Have they? Yeah, they're really more on his plate. They might come here if they want. Yeah, no. No, if he was upset with you, he would have already conquered you and taken you over, and it wouldn't have been a big deal for him. Anyway, um, don't piss him off, by the way. Yeah, uh, just that, I think because she's she's saying basically Rand's, she knows Rand's in the city and is worried about him getting captured and is threatening them with, like, don't fuck with Rand. Basically. Yes. She's definitely meaning to threaten them with Rand. I don't know why, though. I don't get what her grand motivation is with getting taken aside to discuss the Dragon Reborn. I don't know what... uh, What is she doing there? Why does she want to get that time with the council? I honestly think she's just making them... So when they do capture him, if they capture him, that they're going to be hesitant to do anything to move against him. That is like laying some contingencies for plan F right there that she's yes. doing. And she's yeah. like throwing away yeah. a lot of her social capital with Cad Swain by blowing her cover this little bit by going off script. Like she's very not confident in Rand. <laughs> but she's being an absent minded brown. She's not threatening them. She's just discussing history. No, but she's showing Cad Swain that she has the capacity to go off script in a very subtle Aes Sedai way. Yeah, but I think Cat Swain wouldn't respect her if she didn't have her own plans and goals. I, I think it's a weirdly risky move for Varen. I don't understand why she thinks there's that much fight, unless she really doesn't trust Rand, which would be fair. I think, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think she's pretty much at the point where, like, okay, Rand's going to get captured. <laughs> like, we're going to have to do something about this. Like, um, let me start laying down the the bases for how to respond to that as quickly as possible. Yeah, I mean... That I, I could see her anticipating that, but that's not out of character. Or it could be a dark friend move, and she's, you know, following orders to throw a wrench into the works. She has to be chaotic. She has to destabilize thrones. Mm-hmm. She has to show that she's still working for the dark in some capacity. That's not a bad hypothesis, either. Right, because she can't betray the dark until the moment, the hour of her death, and that is right, not yeah, now. Her, she sure hopes not. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that could just be that, yeah. Because we don't get a follow-up, that seems like a very good explanation. And then Harine shows that she loves her sister, and Shalon can't believe it, because apparently everyone in this world is so cold and terrible that the concept of a sister showing love and affection is just unlikely. And it's sad. But Harine shows that she loves Shalon by being like, you seem kind of scared and freaked out by losing the son. I will be comforting to you, because you're my sister, and you comforted me when I was a kid. And also, mm. you're going to go spy on Cat Swain, right? 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 And Shalon's like, eh, yes, I guess. That's nice of you. But also, I'm not going to tell you all my secrets, because that would suck. Um, we get these two council people, uh, Narvis and Kumer, who uh, who uh, Codswain goes off with. Never mentioned again. 
I suspect that what she's doing is laying the groundwork for when Elise is going to fall when she has to be taken down for capturing Rand. Again, I think you're really right about Varen anticipating that. I think Catsman's also anticipating that. And she's thinking, these are the two who are most likely to rise to be the next First Council, and I want to make sure that the next First Council is in my pocket, understands the ground rules. That's what I think she's doing, but I have no evidence for it. I, I researched them, and there's nothing else about them. That's pure headcanon on my part. There's nothing to be had otherwise. But this, you know, this entire interaction was set up and anticipated ahead of time because they left Narishma out there to channel. Yep, and I think I, I, I'm really, I think you're, yeah, this is all because they expect Rand to fail. Like, Varian maybe more than the rest, but, like, they are setting up contingencies upon contingencies upon contingencies and leaving nothing to chance. Yeah, that's all I got. Yeah, I'm trying to think if I have anything else about this chapter. I thought there were a couple of interesting nuggets in there, but... I, wanna, I do want to get mad at Robert Jordan for a moment for Kumira and Kumir. Unnecessary. Unnecessary. <laughs> anyway. Shalon sighed again. It was much too soon to test the depth of her sister's newfound warmth. Confession might bring absolution or not, and she could not live with the loss of her marriage and her rank at one blow. But for the first time since Varen had bluntly laid out Cadswain's terms for keeping her secret, Shalon began to consider confession. Was a good little. I'm glad we did those together because I think the second chapter didn't have enough in it for, an, for its own episode. There's nothing yeah. in that second there chapter. There was a couple of little interesting tidbits, but you're right. It was just, it was. <sighs> so thanks everyone for joining us. Um, next week, you will be getting Jess, the Omerlin seat, instead of me because I will be becoming three teeth less wise uh, during recording, basically. <laughs> Yeah, your your appointment ended up being scheduled, like, right... I had it scheduled for tomorrow, and then the, they called me on Monday and or yesterday and rescheduled it for the day that I had already scheduled off. I already had Jess there to cover for me, but, um, yeah, I will, I will literally be getting poured back into the car roughly around the time that you guys are uh, recording. So you will not be getting me, and then the week after that, I don't think I'm going to want to talk because I'm getting three wisdom teeth removed. <laughs> You had anticipated having 13 days yeah. bet between surgery and recording, and now it's only going to be seven. So we will probably not have an episode that week, and we probably won't have an episode the next week either because it's the 27th, right after Christmas, and travel and everything is going to make that very exactly. difficult. So this is actually the penultimate episode of the year. Yeah, because oh, yeah. This, this is the last time you guys are going to hear me for the year. I will be back on the first of... Uh, the new year, the the third, the first month, third, the third day is, yeah, bro. of the new year, mm -hmm. um, is when I will be back. So you guys are going to be out of luck for your episodes for two weeks. Sorry about that. Just before we turned on recording, I was saying that I'm very excited tonight after this recording. His Dark Materials season three just started coming out yesterday, and I'm very excited to watch the first episode of that tonight. Brandon actually got into it with me and I've been really, really like hidden gemming this one. Like, how did I not realize that this is so good? Like, how did I forget that this is a thing? What network is that on again? HBO. HBO. Okay. Which is part of why I hadn't watched this because I didn't get HBO until very recently. But, oh my God, I've been loving it so much. So I'm very excited about that. And then you said Warrior Nun. And so, Camille, if you're listening... Uh, Warrior Nun is great. Warrior Nun's great.
Oregon has been very fun. I'm working my way through it slowly because it is candy and it will rot my brain if I watch it too fast. It's very fun. Plus, my wisdom tooth extraction got rescheduled for later. So I really have to like space it out in order to still have some left to watch by the time I'm actually laid up on the couch, which was the plan. That's why I got into this show, but now I'm into it and it's a problem. <laughs> So thanks a lot to me. Very helpful. <laughs> I've been watching it with my girlfriend never, and she's she likes it a lot. I'm 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 okay with it. Some of the teenage girl angst is just a little eye rolly for me at this point in my life. Oh, for sure. But I'm like I'm looking at being like healing. Like that's what I was <laughs> shopping for, and now I'm invested in like the nonsense plot. Like it's nonsense, but like it's, it's warrior nuns. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what I didn't realize is I'd actually watched season one already. So, oh, really? for watch, yeah, I, don't, I must have sat down at some point. I think during the pandemic, I watched everything that was available being unemployed. And now, man, like I said, I can't keep up. There's too much, right? I'd love to go watch his dark materials, but it's like the bottom of a like 10 item long list. <laughs> Uh, it's a really good adaptation. Like I, I know it sounds like sacrilege, but like part of me kind of wishes that HBO had done the Wheel of Time adaptation if it had been the crew that did his Dark Materials. Mm, they're doing a good job. With oh it. my god, it's such a good adaptation! Like talk mm-hmm. about bringing the page exact to life. Like there's a few alterations for sure, but like. The amount of literalism to the page is like word for word for scene upon scene. It's very interesting. And it's like, man, you know, if this had been the, the treatment that we got, there would be a lot less bitching. And I mean, it still has woke casting and all of the baggage sure. that would bring. But like, there'd be a lot less of the legitimate angst turning into like hate spiral kind mm-hmm. of stuff if we'd gotten that treatment and it's like i know it's sacrilege to say but yeah i mean i think that that's one of the things that like the wheel of time is not a f- i don't want to use the word faithful it's not a direct adaptation right right in a way that this is right much right. more so a direct adaptation yeah there's it's a sub, sub, subcategory? Is that, is that Yeah, I, f- I feel like there's, there's this way of saying, like, hey, there's this stuff that, that gets made into TV and movies that is as directly from the books as it can possibly be within the constraints of the material that you're given. Wheel of Time did not do that in season one. And I think a lot of people are, got upset about that because they wanted to see the books they loved on screen. I think Wheel of Time in particular is very difficult to do that with because there is so much. I think when when people were talking about TV shows for Wheel of Time, they were talking about 26 season episodes with like 26 episodes per book. You know, (laughs) it's about the only way to adopt everything is that old school TV um, serial production. And then, of course, the, the quality per episode would be way down. But, you know, I miss... I miss filler episodes on TV shows where they had to do some low budget, like a bottle episode where they had to take their five actors and, you know, film an episode in their, in the library where they, and where they just have conversations and they either make all the characters forget who they are or they, Uh, you know, (laughs) those are the most comforting Star Trek episodes are the ones where the plot doesn't do anything and they're just stuck in a dream or something. Mm -hmm. They're the best, most comforting background episodes to watch for sure. You know, and those, those usually focus on a character and give that character a chance to like evolve and grow and, you know, it's the episodes of Matt and Ebudar just bumming around, right? Like having fun, gambling. You know, sure, there might be a dark friend in the background, but he ends up killing him at the end of the episode and it doesn't matter in the long run anyway, <laughs> right? Like, just just give me some bottle episodes. That's all I'm t- asking for. Mm-hmm. Matt, and, Matt and Rand on the road going from end to end. Yeah. Yeah, the need to have every minute count for every possible angle is... I mean, you know how much we love nitpicking this stuff, guys, but, like, it's exhausting. Like, a bit of filler <laughs> just for some character growth, just for some breathing mm-hmm. would would be pleasant. Even though we do go absolutely too hard into these details and I'm becoming <laughs> a verb. You know, I contain multitudes. <laughs> would you like to define that verb? Me as a verb? Um, go, going, way, Getting lost in the weeds. Going way too deep into... 
I mean, I know a lot of other people do this, but I have heard myself used as a verb by other people, I think twice, at least once. So, um, yeah. I've, I've heard like pulling in a radio or being in a radio, <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah. I haven't heard, I haven't heard, oh, I'm, I'm a radioing this show. Okay. Well, maybe, maybe I got my grammar wrong, but still, I'm, it's, <laughs> I'm a meme. Yeah. I'm a meme. <laughs> in this community? For sure. Uh, I'm actually not, this is not the first time I have had a reputation, but this is the nicest reputation I've ever had. <laughs> Interesting. I'd like to hear more. Interesting. I'd like to hear more. <laughs> when I was a kid, I was explosively angry. I still mm. am, but I'm <clears throat> much better at not throwing everything and running out of class on a daily basis now than when I was in first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and I was pretty much done with it by the fifth grade. So you're telling me you were a neurodivergent kid with some issues relating to other people and you lashed out because you couldn't handle your own feelings and emotions? I don't know anything about that. I may have been overstimulated and uh -huh. fed up with everyone's shit mm -hmm. on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. I, w I was considered someone with anger issues as well in yeah. school. And I had yeah. a reputation throughout the entire school because I am very loud. Mm. Something I get from mm -hmm. my mom. I am very, very loud when I'm angry. It is difficult to avoid noticing someone like me screaming their way out of a building that houses all eight grades and the kindergartens. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, oh my God, now there's a meme of me. <laughs> the screaming great. seagull meme of me going to a radius of shit. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so I, in, in Waldorf, we had this thing in, uh, where the first graders and the eighth graders would get paired up for the year. It was like a whole thing they did. And when I was the eighth grader, one of the first graders that I was paired with was like, told me after most of the year had passed, like, I was originally really scared of you because I knew you had a reputation. <laughs> I was like, oh no, like... At this point, I'm like two, three years since my last major meltdown in class. Well, maybe not truly, but like since it was a daily thing and um, but it was just still just like this item of lore. But yeah, I if I had gone to a public school, there is no doubt I would have ended up with a diagnosis and being dosed on something like there's no way <laughs> that I would have escaped uh, public school without that. I was too old. They weren't doing that to kids my age, really. Some some kids, boys had the the ADHD bouncing around anxiety that they medicated, but that was definitely not me. I'd never had trouble focusing, so I would not have been diagnosed. But what I had was anxiety. And if someone put me in a situation that was giving me anxiety and wouldn't let me escape that situation, I would lash out, even though for most people it would be a totally normal situation. I mean, that's how it felt like to me on the inside, but like, it was a very violent thing that I did basically on a daily basis, mm -hmm. but like, I was just overloaded and everyone blamed it on the fucking divorce. See, that's mm -hmm. the frustrating thing is everyone assumed it was the divorce that was making me angry. Yeah. Which didn't help. No, well, like... I'm say, it's not making things better, but yeah, you're not like, that's not the issue, really. That's just like normal life shit. Yeah. So, like my brother's attachment issues mm -hmm. for sure had to do with the divorce, you know, like that was absolutely a divorce related thing. But like me getting so overstimulated by the class and the topic and the struggle to learn things that I just have to yell and throw things and like run away and cry it out and climb up an apple tree for 40 minutes. Like years of that was not because of the divorce. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah, that that's why I, I, this is not the first time I've had a reputation, but this is a much being a nerd who goes too deep into the weeds is much a much better, better reputation than the person who runs and screams and yells and uh, all that. And I mean, kids aren't people yet. They're kids. <clears throat> 
And like, I wasn't even in that stimulating of a classroom. I was in like a hippie school where all mm-hmm. the colors were muted. All the vocal tones were soft and infantilizing. The class sizes were small. We did arts and crafts and lots of like body work. Like it was not even as stimulating as a public school. So it's like, again, if I had gone to public school, <laughs> that would not have gone well. It, it just would not, it, it did not when I went to public high school. I tried two public high schools in two years and then got my GED so that I could get the fuck out of there. It did not go well. I did not like run out of class in high school so much, but still it did not go well. I just loved my big textbooks because I could hide, you know, paperbacks inside of them. I'm sure I did a terrible job with it, but you know, (laughs) I I definitely got told by teachers. Oh, they were just like, could you please stop reading? I'd be like, well, I'm getting an A in this class. Why do I have to stop reading? You're not that, <laughs> it's not that hard. I remember one of my friends, my best friend, because there weren't so many kids in my class, but my best friend, at one point we did like a yearbooky kind of art project. And I remember she wrote on my, like, already is my best friend, but she reads all the time and it's hard to hang out with her. <laughs> I should dig that up and look at it when I'm having my like self-diagnosis doubts. <laughs> <laughs> Because, like, she's my best friend, and she's like, Aradia is so weird. She reads all the time. All the time. It's so difficult to be with her. Uh, uh, let's see. Reading-wise, I've been enjoying um, The Thousand Earths. It's a sci-fi novel about what happens at the end of the universe, assuming humanity has survived that far, and sort of the steps humanity goes through to survive to the end of the universe. And there's this guy who keeps, you know... He's using relativity to keep flying away and flying back. And, you know, he's that plus, uh, you know, body rebuilding mods that are keeping him alive. And he's just like, oh, I'm going to go away for going to accelerate at 5G for a couple hundred years and then come back and see what's changed. that. And relativistically, that's a, that's like a trillion years. So mm-hmm, I'm going to ch- mm-hmm. check it out in a trillion years and I'll be back. And, uh, yeah, it's an interesting little what if situation. Um, pretty well written. That's cool. Um, and it's heat death of the universe is sort of what it's, uh, assuming is going to happen is eventually like as energy goes away, how do humans keep trying to, you know, outlive the death of stars and black holes and all that kind of stuff. And, but, and it makes up a bunch of physics, right? Like, sure. sure. <laughs> it's like, okay, we're, we're assuming we're going to, you know, first they tap into the dark energy expansion of the universe. That's how he's like going out, accelerating for a trillion years as he's like tapping into dark energy. And then after that, there's this whole thing about like how, as the universe cools, you know, you can have increasing entropy, but also increasing complexity up to a certain point because it requires less energy to simulate something. It was, it was a bit, it was a lot of technical gobbledygook that is, you know, only vaguely related to modern physics. It's fun though. Yeah, but it was fun. It's sort of fun to be like, this is how the the one possible imagination of what's going to happen. Because like eventually time will pass and that will happen, right? Mm -hmm. Trillions Mm -hmm. of years will happen. So it's sort of a, a, a neat imagining of like, Assuming humans, you know, early on, he's like, well, we're smart. And so we have this pressure to stay like we are because we see what we are. And so there's this evolutionary pressure to, like, copy that. And so people keep coming back to the human form. Mm, no, that's yeah. incorrect. We're all going to become crabs. Right. Yeah, we're all going to be crabs. Everybody knows people. we're going to yep. all become crabs. <laughs> Sanderson certainly knows that. Um, <laughs> True. <laughs> he does right crab people. Uh, no, it was just, and in, 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 like, there's a bunch of stuff in the book where I'm like, okay, you're just saying that this, what if humans lasted for the rest of the universe, right? I get that. I can forgive that sort of ignorance of the human pressure. You sort of wave it off with this, like, oh, yeah human intelligence causes us to want to stay human it's a silly premise but okay fine whatever we'll allow it right yeah yeah (laughs) the heat death of the universe is a more interesting plot than nitpicking genetic expansion exactly exactly and and he doesn't want to like mess with like oh the blobs at the end of the universe that have like right right. easier to write people people right so absolutely it's why we forgive so many universal language 
uh, mechanics in so many books and mm-hmm. stories or just whatever. It's fine. We don't want to deal with 18 languages and 45 translators. And no, just Mm-mm. give them a babble fish or whatever. Right. It's fine. Right. Yep. Yep. Especially if you're going into the future, right? Like you just assume that's an invent. Because like at this point, Google does a pretty decent job of translating people in real time, right? Mm-hmm. It's really like you can have a Google phone pointed at somebody it will record them, translate the text, and you can have it read it back to you. Mm-hmm. So, like, having, I mean, you know, imagining an earbud that does that in real time doesn't seem to be all that insane when, when no. you come to futuristic tech. Not at all. However, doing it in a 3,000-year-old world that would have had lots of isolated communities and absolutely no reason to keep language the same... And everybody speaking common at the same time feels a little ridiculous. But they have books and Ogier and I Sedai to help keep the language pure. And the people in the two rivers who have been isolated for a thousand years would not have developed any other dialect? That's that's not how dialects work. No. No, it's not. They would have got a slight accent? No, that's not how no, that works. The, the, the whole... No, it's... One of his most egregious assumptions. Right. When you look at the language drift in America in 300 years and the accents that are going from Texas to Northeast to West Coast. Yeah. Like, can I understand someone from Louisiana? Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. Not if they're going full out. Right. And that's, again, 300-ish years. Maybe What are we on? 400 maybe now? If you want to talk about, like... Yeah, if you consider the way language has been evolving in the Deep South, yes, that 400 would probably be a more appropriate number. Mm -hmm. 3,000 without telegraphs, without, yeah, no. Perpetual wars pushing people back, Mm -hmm. whereas we've had perpetual population growth expanding Mm -hmm. the number of people speaking our Mm -hmm. languages. Like, it, yeah, I just, it's a big old hand wave. It has to be. How old is Old English? A thousand years? Yeah, unintelligible. Yeah, unintelligible. Completely. completely. It makes a deep Louisiana accent sound like the most crystal clear Midwest customer service person, relatively mm-hmm. speaking. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> so anyway, we all speak common now, and it's very easy to pick up because if you know the old tongue, common is simple. Apparently, that's why the Forsaken can speak it um, without accents or any issues whatsoever. You know, the other problem with this, though, the other annoying thing about this. Is that he, then he says that genetics does work like that, that people are going to splinter out and become mm-hmm. very, very, like, visually coded by nationality in just 3,000 years. Mm-hmm. Nations that are much younger than 3,000 years, but like regions that, mm-hmm. you know, the world gets rewritten, clock starts over, and 3,000 years later, people are, like, heavily differentiated out by affinity group genetically, but not linguistically, except for... um Except for doobie doobie doo, obviously. <laughs> yeah. But that that again is just like a fucking accent, right? Like Yeah, only they have a weird affectation. They somehow have that and keep that, but no other linguistic drift is happening. Just that one weird little thing. Oh, and the Sean Chan get a Texas accent after uh, on another freaking continent for however many long however long. Yeah. And Sean Chan doesn't end up as one genetic group. No, they have lots of different groups. Mm-hmm. It's, it's just he he plays so fast and loose with this that it's very hard for me to allow the hand wave because it's like, stick with your own rules. <laughs> just internal consistency. Tower of Genji. Come on. They just have to be consistent. They can be as irrational as you want as long as they're consistent. This is right after you said we forgive people for doing this because it's very difficult and we don't want to do all the translators. I contain multitudes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, if you don't want to get into politics, uh, please skip this one. It's we go pretty far off the uh, liberal politics deep end. You know, I feel like at this point we could really get into a conversation about, you know, weapon control and gun control if we wanted to, because I think there's a, a, a real argument to be said, like, hey, men don't need weapons because all they do with them is kill each other. And we don't like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is uh, an attitude that they are enforcing quite firmly in their city and the few people we talk to seem to be very happy with that state of affairs 
Right. And it is, it's this idea that, oh, elsewhere, which I think our main characters are like, well, how are they going to defend themselves? That's ridiculous. But in the city, like, yeah, no, men are the problem. Like, and it's hard for me to look at the mass shootings, especially in our country. Most shootings are done by men. Most suicides by gun are men. Yeah. Right. There's a certain amount of giving men weapons and taking weapons away from men does kind of stop the violence. It's remarkable. <laughs> and, yeah. It's like guns. There's, yes, there's a lot of guns in the United States. But you know what there's also a lot of? Not men. Who are yeah, and all of these not men are pretty significantly underrepresented in the gun violence that is happening. So like, yeah, the prevalence of guns is part of the problem. But toxic masculinity is the other part, right? Like, <laughs> I think that's the bigger part of the problem, because if if those people don't have guns, some of them are going to decide to find other things. Some of them will be discouraged by a lack of guns mm -hmm. and a lot of them won't. You know, like these people are doing so many other terrible, violent things with their fists and their words and their mm -hmm. cars. Like, it's just, you know, and then the number of trans men I have seen make videos or posts on the Internet being like, you have any idea how much more emotional I am now that I'm on testosterone? Mm -hmm. Like someone who literally went from the female hormonal profile to a male hormonal profile being like, I am so much more emotional and so much more trigger happy and rage filled. Like it's very frustrating to have women constantly be told they're too emotional to like vote or own property <laughs> and then have this situation come up. Realize that it's actually the fact that men are the ones who are way too emotional all the time. And women don't have to deal with the uh, like same level of testosterone that drives men absolutely insane. Frustrating. Yeah. Well, which is, you know, and then I'll, I come back to toxic masculinity. Like we don't let men talk about their feelings, even though they're, they're the ones who are feeling the most. Yes, yes. The socialization of repressing all your feelings is it makes everyone angry. When you repress your feelings, you become mm -hmm. an angry person. When you make that the culture of a whole gender identity. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I, I saw an interesting quote that I actually really liked. It was men aren't the problem. Toxic masculinity is the problem. Yes, 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 yes. White people aren't the problem. White supremacy is the problem, <laughs> right? Like, right. I mean, whiteness is a problem, but that's a conversation to unpack. But yes, absolutely. It's like being male doesn't make you the problem. It's subscribing mm -hmm. to this toxic masculinity and having no support to do anything else that is the problem. And being in a society that also supports it, exactly. right? Like, same thing with like being, being a white person isn't a problem. Being in a society where white supremacy is the assumption and you benefit from a ingrained preference among everybody around you. Yeah. That's, that's a problem. Yeah. And you do have this sort of advantage of living in a society where, that is under the white supremacy, patriarchal system, yeah. you know? And like, it, it's, it's so hard to separate those two. Cause when someone says, well, I'm a guy and I'm white and I don't think I'm, you know, I don't think I'm the problem. And it's like that. Well, you are the problem. If you're taking the time to say that, then you are well, the problem. Yeah. <laughs> so start there. Well, but you know, <laughs> Even even back to Patrick, when the first time Patrick and I had a conversation about white privilege, I he got so angry. Oh, yeah, I remember you told me about so that. So angry, you know, because he didn't believe. He's like, I grew up poor. I grew up disadvantaged. I didn't have any advantages. So I don't understand why you're telling me I have this, you know. Yeah, white uh, privilege. Like, I'm not privileged. White privilege. Yeah. Like, I, uh, I'm not privileged. You know, like, I, I can't have white privilege because I'm not privileged, right? That's, I think, where some people come with that. And it's like, that's not what it's about. Because because of the intersection of class is not an analysis being mm -hmm. brought into the fucking conversation. And, like, if you don't bring class into it, you were going to lose. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. race is absolutely critical. But if you leave class out, like, it's going to trip up on people like that every fucking time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's very... Yeah. And what you have to tell people is white privilege isn't about the, the advantages you have. It's about the d disadvantages you exactly. don't have. Exactly. Exactly. It's another one of those. You should have picked a better brand. You should have made better words. And right. it's like, I don't if we are if you are more concerned about the branding of a concept than about the point of the concept, you are, again, part of the problem. Can we talk about critical race theory briefly in this context? Uh huh. Because 
CRT is a college graduate college level idea that is only taught to people who specifically go into the uh, studying it. It is a legal theory for grad students, legal grad students, grad students who are right. studying the fucking law. And people have been like, oh, but if you teach history where white people aren't the good guys all the time, you're teaching critical race theory. So it's been rebranded as this other thing. And the fun part is that was on purpose. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's very purpose. documented that that was mm-hmm. absolutely an on purpose thing. We are going to take a term. We are going to warp it. We are going to make it meaningless so as to derail progress and conversations. Mm-hmm. It's really frustrating. And if you've been suckered into that, I'm sorry. <laughs> mm-hmm. As a former teacher, every once in a while I get in a conversation with parents and I'm like, parents need to just bugger out of classes. And they're like, well, but my, and then they tell me about the situation where they found one teacher was teaching something very specific. They didn't want their kids to learn or was wrong. And they're like, but what, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to just ignore that? And I'm like, parents need a lot less power when it comes to what teachers are teaching, like just in general. Yeah. Like, and that's going to create some situations where kids are going to learn some things you don't want them to learn, but you can't prevent your kid from being exposed to certain ideas. And you shouldn't. When they're going to school. Yeah. If your ways are so superior to mine, your child Mm -hmm. will figure that out Mm -hmm. by being exposed to the information. If your way being their choice is threatened by more information, that sounds like a you problem. As we speak with two people without children. So, you know, take that with our grain of salt. No, that's like literally some an attitude that I got from my mom. Like, she was very aggressive telling me that she was how she was raising me. Like. <laughs> and as someone who's teaching and had to deal with parents. And let me tell you, the kids who had issues, I just I didn't understand why I couldn't, you know, why they didn't have any confidence, why they didn't believe in themselves. And then I'd meet the, or why they were just mean. And then I'd meet the parents and go, oh, that's why. You either had a parent who belittled you or demonstrated being mean as a way to get ahead in life. Yeah, it's it's just the smallness and the narrowness and the fear that lets people rile themselves up into that. It's just so it's so limiting, guys. You don't have to do that. You don't. You really don't. Like you could just allow people to exist. And like, honestly, teaching that America is a fucking garbage pile like a flaming dumpster fire is like i'm sorry but that's the reality of Mm -hmm. the situation like it's not critical race theory to teach history and it's not a bad thing to teach history like even if critical race theory was just teaching history and not a more nuanced legal theory we still need to be talking about all of this stuff regardless like well and i really feel like i had to go back and re-examine all the american history i learned as an adult, because understanding a lot of decisions were made because of racism. And I I don't think that that's necessarily obvious to people who are growing up that race is this incredibly, inherently deep seated, I hate using the term original sin of our country, right? It existed at the founding of our country. And a lot of the decisions we've made have to do with racism and slavery and the freeing of the slaves and then the civil rights and then new Jim Crow. And I'm doing those out loud of order, but you get the idea. There's all these things that decisions about our politics and housing and credit scores and freeway design (laughs) have come down to just incredible amounts of racism. And if you don't acknowledge that you're missing a huge piece of the puzzle as to why things are the way they are in a modern America. And nobody's, you know, I I think people like, Oh, it's this blame game or where you're blaming these children. And it's like, no, no, that's not what's going on. We're just trying to accurately portray all of the attitudes and reasons why certain th- decisions were made. And a big part of that is we don't want, you know, there's a reason why there aren't any fucking public pools anymore. And it's because you couldn't have whites only public pools. So rather than have n- mixed public pools, they shut them all down. And so much of the same thing with healthcare. The reason there's not universal healthcare is because we don't want to give it to minorities. And if you make it universal, you have to give it to everybody. Same for schools. Public school versus private schools. And I went to mm-hmm. a private school. 
for my whole education. I went to public school just for high school and that sucked. But like, I was in the whitest state that there is. So like, not that I had anything to do with the racial makeup of the school. I just hated the system. But like, yeah, it's, it's always about race in this country. And Mm -hmm. like, yeah, it's like, yes, it does feel bad to learn that you have been lied to. But the solution to that Mm -hmm. is not to keep the wool in position. And not to keep lying to the next like, generation of people. That's right. yeah. not like, yes, it will be uncomfortable for some people who are of good conscience and who have been taught to believe that they're good people to learn that they are upholding systems that do incredible harm. That will be uncomfortable. But is that a reason to not participate? No. And a lot of kids are way more resilient because also like no person is out there trying to get guilt from the oppressor class like guilt is the least useful possible reaction anybody could have to this like all the activists all the teachers all they're just trying to like create a conversation that creates a better world like better world. we we all want that we all want that yeah learn your history so you don't repeat it learn about the racist history of the country so we don't repeat it right and learn and like it's and learning a lens to see it all through is time consuming Like, Mm -hmm. it is time consuming to learn how to see that racism is affecting everything. Like, you want to get a jump start on it? Read Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. Because my goodness, is that a lens to just, we live in a racial caste system. Like, Mm -hmm. oh, when once you frame it that way, it's like everything starts to fall into place. But still, it's going to take you a decade before you even start cracking your teeth on a podcast about it, I promise. Uh, Margot Sedai is suggesting Lies My Teacher Told Me and Lies Across America as two books uh, by James W. Lowren. Uh, so those are two good books. to, And I've, I've definitely heard about those, um, specifically The Lies My Teacher Told Me, as a good way to sort of reexamine all the information that you learned under a new lens. Yeah, I haven't read those. But yeah, any any book that's out there to take what you know and twist it. Like, you know how we love plot twists mm-hmm. and uh, trope reverses? Right, like, right, right. Turns right. out that works pretty well in nonfiction as well to help make the information fall Actually, into context. That's, that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> it's really funny. You get this little, okay, you've learned all that history. Guess what? It was all racist. Oh, yeah. my God. That's a twist I didn't see coming. But in retrospect, totally makes <laughs> sense. Twist. All those decisions that didn't have any reason behind them. Oh, you know, it's just I, it felt like one of those to me when I discovered just how um, relevant racism was in the history of America. And of course, it makes sense. Like you had two cultures that I mean, oh, fuck. I mean, the fact that the the housing bubble had an analogy in slavery. Have I told you about this? No, you haven't. Okay. So you know how we leveraged loans against our property? Yeah. And there was this big boom of housing properties where the investment kept going up and up and up and people thought it would go up forever. So they kept buying more and more and more. But eventually it realized that there was people couldn't pay back those loans. Replace housing property with slave property, right? So back in the day, land was essentially worthless because there was always more land. You could just go west. So there was no speculation around land. The speculation was around the people who were used to work the land. That's where wealth came from. Right, right, right. Right? Because you can claim land all you want, but if you can't work it, it's worthless. It just sits there fallow. So... When the cotton gin came out, all of a sudden it became so more, so, so much more efficient to process cotton and the world wanted cotton. And so there was this huge speculative boom of investment around property, which was slaves at the time to make cotton, but they produced so much cotton that they flooded the world market. And basically, there was a crash, and there was an exact duplicate of the property housing crash, only it came with slavery as the thing people were invested in. Wow. I have remembered hearing about how the cotton gin was terrible for the quality of life for enslaved people. I hadn't heard it framed in that parallel. Uh, Economic stuff goes over my head so easy, but oh, Oh, 
Wow. Yeah. Yeah. We did an exact housing bubble crisis, only instead of investing in houses, people were investing in slaves. Yikes. And and the bottom fell out when the bottom fell out of the cotton market. Right. Right. Yeah. Because that's what happens. Oh, man. Wow. That's... I mean, yeah, all the wealth of this country is built on slavery. It's all fucked up. But to have it put into a context that I can almost actually wrap my head around as a person who normally doesn't get money is like, oh. Yeah, the credit default swaps and all that kind of stuff. Like, all that stuff was happening, except instead of investing in in land, because land was, for all intents and purposes, infinite, you were investing in slaves. Yay, capitalism. (laughs) Right? Yeah. And we haven't, and now we just, yeah, same boom and bust economy that's always been around. The other really interesting lens that to bring into all of that too as long with uh oh it's all about race is also it's all about class like the history of Mm -hmm. labor in this country oh my fucking god Mm -hmm. that's a much more recent discovery Mm -hmm. for me is how much the history of labor is like a thing to study and uh uh, guys we 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 live in 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 some real feudal bullshit we live in some Mm -hmm. real real feudal bullshit uh, if you start bringing a class analysis and a labor union or a labor history uh, analysis, to, uh, um, this real fuel. And I heard, I heard recent, recently an interesting breakdown of class, right? So we think of class of upper little class, lower middle class. You've got your managers, you've got your workers. That feels like a false way to classify things. The thing I read said there's working class. An investor class is really how you yeah. should be looking at it. The people mm-hmm. who make money because they have money and the people who make money by working. And it doesn't matter how much money you make. You know, football players who are making millions of dollars are still working, working class. Some of them become investment class when they buy businesses and stuff like that. Um, you know, there's a way to convert from one to the other. But yeah, the idea that even your boss is still working class and should be on your side because he's not making money off investing yes yes and and your 401k doesn't count right like that's not (laughs) no no yeah no there's a there's a whole other world and uh Mm -hmm. yeah it's it's uh just you know this is a deep nerd fact but there are more of us than of them deep nerd fact why does the bigger class not eat the smaller class it's only gonna take a couple eat the rich don't just stream it on twitch it's only going to take one. Uh, and then talk is saying about three million is sort of the baseline you need in cash to be able to invest to become investor class. Um, but that's going that's gone up significantly. <laughs> uh, just wait five minutes. It'll change like the weather. Right. Right. So should we get back to the book? We've gone on a mother of all tangents. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's time to reel it in. Bring it home. That we, we, we took uh, weapons control and went full on politics. Thank you for listening to the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. Rate us in the Apple Podcast app or support us on Patreon. Is that good enough?